joined with Rob Cononello here from New York. So we're really making ourselves international at the moment. Rob, I met in um, Boston when I went out there to teach for Storts Medical. And I was there with Carson Knobloch and Thomas Stiele from Storts. And we met Rob there and he, he really kind of um, caught my eye as one of the people that, that really kind of knew his stuff. And I think it'd be really interesting for everyone around the world that's interested in Shockwave to hear what Rob has to say on the subject. So Rob, welcome to paulhober.com. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Paul. No problem at all. Um, now, we're amid the coronavirus and uh, we're all pretty much on lockdown. But it, it, what this gives an opportunity for is that people can really start to do a load of CPD and, and this will all count so people can hear yours and, and my views as we go through this. It's a nice relaxed discussion. Yeah, I've got a few questions just to keep things moving along. But really what this is all about is getting your take on it and understanding a bit more about the Central American market and how that might differ to what we're doing in Europe or, or the rest of the world. Because, you know, obviously we get a worldwide audience and people are interested. I mean, even the fact you call radio shockwaves something different. But first of all, Rob, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, give us a little bio on you. Sure. So, um, like I said, my name is Rob Cannanello. I'm in private practice in Orangeburg, New York, which is about 10 miles north of uh, Manhattan. Um, I've been in practice for 30 years, and my practice is basically a, a sports medicine-based practice. Um, although it's well-rounded, we see everyone from all ages, you know, we kind of believe in a, the methodology that we're all athletes just in different levels of training. So I, I approach each one of my patients as though they're an athlete, someone who has a goal and uh, wants to work to get themselves better to reach their goals. Um, my practice has evolved, to be quite honest, from one where you know, when you're first starting out, you'll see anybody to one where you start seeing such uh, a variety of different types of patients and you have to figure out different ways of how to treat patients. And one of the things that I've, I've thought about after doing some of these talks in the past is, you know, when you, when you have 30 years of experience in doing something like this, sometimes you like to go back to those patients you saw way back when and say, hey, I'm sorry. You know, because some of the things that we did, um, I would never do now. And uh, obviously some of the things that I do now weren't available back then. And, um, you know, my, my methodology has changed quite a bit in how I treat many different type of pathologies. Very good. So what was your, what was your journey into Shockwave then? How long ago did you find out about it? Uh, who introduced you to it? And, and what were your early experiences on it? Sure. So I've um, been dealing with Shockwave, gosh, for close to 20 years now, to be quite honest. Um, I, was, uh, I am a fellow of the American Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine, for which I became the president uh, afterwards. But I, was I got experience with Shockwave early on. Um, back uh, probably in the, in the late 90s, um, dealing with some of the bigger systems, the uh, what we used to call high energy Ocitron type of products back then. Um, and we would utilize those in our practice. And um, we were so amazed at how well uh, they were healing and treating and um, really not just treating, but actually curing patients with um, tendinopathies at that time. Um, for the most part, we were just dealing at back that time with people with heel and arch pain and Achilles issues. Um, and it would bring a large machine into your office and uh, you had anesthetize the patient. And, um, and then they would go through uh, this one series and then see how they would do. And remarkably, they would do really, really well. Um, in the US, it's a, it's a fee for service for doing that. And it was quite expensive. And the technology was starting to get a little dated and uh, we, um, it kind of fell off the map a little bit, to be quite honest, um, using Shockwave. Uh, because there were so many different people doing it and charging different amounts and getting different um, um, outcomes, it was a little frustrating. So uh, lo and behold, when the newer technology came about, uh, we, we jumped on board and I wanted to learn as much as possible at the time. Um, for me, the journey started with meeting um, the people from Kermetics, and uh, they used the stores product. And um, at the time, it was just a, um, a radial device. And um, since I was an early adapter to utilizing them, 
and they knew that I'm, I knew a lot of people due to the fact that I was at the time was the president of the Sports Medicine Academy. Um, they were a really good company, really good people. And I said to them, hey, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure if this is, is going to work. So uh, can I utilize this device? So they actually gave me the device to utilize for close to six months um, without having to be, without being charged for it. And uh, I really got hands-on ability to treat anybody and everybody I wanted to. And that really is where I was like, I dove right in and I gave everyone the opportunity. I wasn't charging the patient at the time. Um, I just wanted to see how it was. And I really um, I got experience doing on several hundred individuals within that six month period of time. And my outcomes were through the roof. It was, it was amazing. So that's kind of where we are, you know, right now. And then it's evolved, obviously, since then, from the uh, small radial device to our, our focal device or higher energy uh, device and, um, and how we utilize those together. Oh, brilliant. And, and when I was in the States, um, everyone was referring to EPAT rather than, yeah. than radial. What, what's EPAT stand for? So EPAT uh, is our word for radio, which is extra corporeal outside the body activated technology. Um, it's a word that's really just kind of made up by the shockwave company. Um, it's basically radial shockwave um, or, or ESWT. So, um, you know, it's just a good buzzword to use. So yeah, it's, it's just shockwave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it threw me uh, last year when, I came in to, to teach radial shockwave and, and focus shockwave and, and all these signs were up talking about EPAT and everyone's saying, oh, do you use EPAT? And I'm going, am I in the wrong conference here? But, uh, but it turns out I was in the right place. So, so that's pretty good. It's quite, so, it's quite funny you should bring that up because even when I get uh, referrals from physios or from primary care doctors, they'll write down EPAC, EPOP. You know, they have no idea what it is or to say it's shockwave therapy. So it's uh, some people don't even know. They, they think it's electrical shockwave therapy, like in one of the cuckoo's nest. So there's a lot of um, misunderstanding by people within the know as well. Oh, well, it's uh, it, it's growing and growing. And now if you, you know, Google shockwave therapy or ESWT or radial pressure wave, you know, there's loads and loads of resources out there. One of the reasons why. I like to bring people like you onto onto my channel is because I realized that traveling around the world, um, teaching people, I was getting so much information, not from necessarily uh, just listening to the, the lectures or, or giving the lecture, but the time in between when you're talking to people like yourself over lunch break, over coffee break. And these are the things that people were really missing out on. And I thought, well, if I could bring that to to a page that everyone around the world could enjoy then then it would be really good and and i'm pleased that, that we had plenty of chats outside of the the lecturing stuff and a few few drinks in the evening as well it's always fun um make it bad so, yeah <laughs> um so how many times a day would you be using a shockwave device of some sort yeah, I would say it'd probably be anywhere between five or 10 times a day, and that's five days a week. So the, the machine is usually humming quite a bit. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're starting to realize the more we use it, the more um, other opportunities there are to use it as well. Um, at the beginning, like I said, we were using it mostly just for tendinopathies, mainly heel and arch pain and Achilles issues. And then you realize that there's so many different issues you, you can utilize it for, um, albeit from, uh, tendinopathy is further up from the foot. Um, in, in, in New York, where I practice, we're, we're kind of we deal mostly with the lower extremity from the knee down. Um, but, you know, we're doing it a lot more now for things like um, medial tibial stress syndrome, shin splints. Um, uh, I do it a lot now for forefoot pain, uh, metatarsalgia, uh, even though I don't like that word. Um, but, you know, any kind of forefoot issue that we deal, we deal a lot of it for patients who have uh, delayed bone healing, um, either from fractures or from avascular necrosis. Um, it's been brilliant as far as that goes. I can't believe how well it works. Um, and recently, we've been doing a lot more of it for um, delayed wound healing uh, with our diabetics, um, <clears throat> as well as for um, scar revisions and uh, things like that. 
Oh, amazing. Um, and, and you have a kind of a, a charging system in the US, don't you? So, so we, either, we either have private patients or people that have bought into a private healthcare package, whereas yours is all private healthcare packages. Is that right? You, you get some cash payers or? Well, no, to be quite honest, for Shockwave, it's all fee for service. So um, our patients might be coming in and being, they might be, uh, we have the Medicare system here, which is uh, for older patients and then other patients have their own healthcare um, insurance companies. But anything that we offer as far as from the Shockwave point of view is a fee for service, um, which, which is a little kind of frustrating sometimes too, because depending upon your locale um, and the individual doctor, the price can be very varied from one to the other. But we try to keep it reasonable. We try to keep it um, affordable for the patient. Um, you know, the reality is that it's a very, very expensive piece of equipment to, to own and utilize and maintain. Um, <clears throat> so there has to be a, a good balance between what's fair for the patient, what's fair for the practitioner. Um, that being said, is that you also want these patients to have the opportunity to utilize it. So you don't want to price the patient out of it because, like I said before, it's not a treatment, it's a cure. It's something that can keep them from having to do things later on. And I use that in my explanation to the patients as well. I say, hey, um, you know, I know you in the past, you've had three or more cortisone injections and you've gone through all the other typical things for the stuff you've had. And it's not getting any better. And I always say that's kind of like um, the definition of insanity. You're keeping getting these injections. It's not getting any better. And you're looking for a, a, a positive outcome. It's not going to happen. Um, and we have to realize that what we're dealing with at that point in time is something very different. We're dealing with something that maybe is fibrotic, scarred, um, and uh, needs something where we can generate new blood flow to the area. And that's where Shockwave comes in, and that's where we want to make it accessible for these individuals. No, brilliant. And, and, and I totally agree. You know, we invest heavily in getting the equipment, which the equipment manufacturers are very happy about, right? But, <laughs> um, but, but then we've got to find a way of, of making that pay for itself. And people often talk about Shockwave being expensive. Um, I think it takes a number of months for us to start to see any kind of um, improvement in our, in our remuneration because you, you've got to pay back the machine. Um, and like you said, the upkeep of the machine, the, you know, the various tests and, and services it has to go through, and then our own commitment to continued learning because there's, you know, there's over 300 papers a year coming out. We've got to keep on top of that. We've got to keep our CPD. You, you like I go to lots of events and stuff. So all of that has to be brought into one to, to do a cost analysis. And I think that because over the years there's been various machines in, in people's clinics where that's just been part of the treatment protocol, it, it's the way in which you present Shockwave to, to a patient to explain to them how it's different and therefore, you know, why there's a charge. Um, so what what is your... What would you say your, your go-to protocol is? So to take a, uh, an indication that's straight down the middle, um, what, what would you use? How many shocks? What sort of bar pressure or, or energy flux density? Do you change the hertz much? G give us a feel for, for what Rob Cononello does in terms of his treatment parameters. Yeah, so for, uh, let's take the, the most common thing that I see in my practice is heel and arch pain, plantar fasciosis. Um, for those individuals, we, we first of all, first of all, before we even get into that, this is not a magic box. This is something that is an adjunct that helps all of our other um, things that we learn as clinicians. And that's taking good history and physical and, and, um, and working them up and teaching them all the other things and making sure that, you know, are they living a healthy lifestyle? Or are they keeping their BMI down? Are they maintaining their mobility? Are they staying strong? And then are they improving on their weaknesses? Those are things that have to be uh, talked about beforehand. If we're talking about an athlete, an athlete also has to make sure that, you know, if they're, uh, say they're a runner, are, is their form good? Uh, are there, is their footwear appropriate for what, who they are? Um, so those are all the things that have to be uh, put down first because, you know, I don't want clinicians just to think I'm getting this magic box and everything is better because it's not just that. It, it really involves 
um, and it encompasses everything that we just talked about. Um, but if, if someone does come to me and they say, listen, doc, I've had this problem for over six months and nothing has worked and I went through this. And usually these are the patients that come to me, my recalcitrant patients, they usually come with a bag of goodies and I say, these are the sneakers I've worn. These are the orthotics I've had. Um, this is all the contraptions I've got off of uh, Amazon and, um, and nothing seems to help me. So what do I do? So we explain to them what shockwave is all about. And for me, I usually utilize five to six treatments. I tell the patient that um, we're going to utilize a combination of both radial and focal shockwave, as well as vibration. Um, so what I usually do for my in the first session and, and follow up from there is that we, we start off with, with vibration therapy and um, you know we, we kind of soothe them and make them understand what the feeling is going to be like to have an applicator on you uh, with the, the gel and everything so they kind of move into it really simply that way and then I work into doing my radial shock wave so um, I, I usually will start off with about 4,000 pulses and um, my energy, I try to get up to at least 2.5 bar um, for those individuals. Sometimes we'll go even higher if we can. It depends upon the size of the individual. If I have a, a very large man, um, a shot putter, you know, we might be able to go higher than I suppose if we have a 110 pound uh, distance runner. So um, we, we try to go to their, their intensity level, but at the same time, they always say to me, they always get nervous, I heard this hurts. And I'm like, sure it hurts. It hurts if we start off at level 10, but we're gonna start off slow and titrate you up to get you to that point where we can at least get to that 2.5 bar at the beginning. Um, and then after we do that, um, and that usually takes anywhere from you know, three to four minutes, um, we utilize our, uh, we, we either utilize a, 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 one of the different applicator heads for the radial, and sometimes we'll do that, but then I usually will move forward and do um, focus shock wave in a, in a pinpoint area. And the focus shock wave kind of really gets to that one spot that might be the, the trigger point that's um, most uncomfortable for the individual. And with those type of scenarios, we kind of utilize about 1,500 pulses, and um, we try to get up to their six out of 10 range of dealing with discomfort. Yeah, very, very good. And, and that's, that's lovely to hear because it's very similar to how I work and other people are around the globe that I talk to. So the... The standardized protocol is one of the things that I would like to champion, that we're really working hard to, to deliver something. Now, I, I don't like the idea that we have a prescriptive approach because as, as Jens Lundgren from Sweden, he put it very, very succinctly. He said, I'm talking to the patient and once I get to the point where they're that five, six out of 10, then I look to what the numbers are saying. I'm not looking to the numbers first and I think we we're, we're getting to the point where everyone's in agreement we're treating the patient in front of us it is an extension of your arm and your clinical reasoning when you're using it um, uh, and so that that's really great but we do need to try and get to that kind of I think almost minimum level of, of energy flux density or bar pressure in, in order for us to be to be doing the thing that we want to do so yeah. you're quite right it, it, it needs to be I say to my patients, it's not sensation free rather than it's painful, but um, you know, five out of 10, it's a personal thing. Some people, they, they say it's five, you know, and the machine's not even touching them. And other people are kind of saying, crank it up, go more, go more, go more. So um, we've got to deal with that as clinicians. And we're, we're well used to people's methods of reporting pain and stuff like that. Um, so you like, I'll be, I'll be reading a ton of research, Rob, and, is there is there one particular paper or book or or person that that really has been a game changer for you in terms of I mean you've been using this for twenty years so what would you say your your go to thing is so uh, I utilize a lot of the the books that um, were written by uh, Ludger Gutesheimer Gutesheimer sorry um, from Germany I believe um, yeah or Austria yeah and uh, yeah. And he's been one of the champions for us, and he kind of lectures quite a bit through our academy um, about what what you different type of treatments. And uh, so we, we always have their books around, and we give this to our residents too, so they can understand and read it as well. Um, I, I'll just show you, I, Rob, what, what's what's yeah. propping my what's propping my computer up here. 
Uh, there you go. That's great. That's great. See, we're, we're, we're in sync, which is good. Yeah. Um, so that, that's definitely one of my go-tos and there's a whole bunch of different, uh, ones of these people, uh, shockwave therapy and practice, um, that also go through not only the, the applications, but, uh, the diagnostic, diagnostic ways of dealing with it with through, uh, diagnostic ultrasound, which is a tool that we use quite a bit in our practice as well, not just for us, but also help, help the, uh, the patient understand their pathology a little bit better. When they see it, they understand it. Um, it almost sells them to treatment, not that we're selling um, for economic reasons, but to sell them the, the understanding of how we can help them, um, which I think is very important. Um, you know, that obviously I try to stay on top of things with the papers that have been out. Um, uh, I know here in the U.S., Amal Saxena has been a champion for writing a lot of papers as far as dealing with Achilles issues and, and sesamoid issues and four foot pain and, and, and the way that uh, shockwave therapy makes a difference. So um, yeah, we try to, I try to read whatever comes across, uh, you know, all different uh, types of uh, journals and I'll, I'll be it from um, medical uh, to all the other ones that are available. Um, you know, and I try to stay away from uh, anecdotal things. Um, and I try to stay away from people's websites and things like that too, because uh, I'm a big believer in evidence-based medicine. And uh, I want to be able to tell my patient, hey, this has been proven. This is um, proven for your condition. Because they ask me, why is it not covered? You know, is it, is it something that doesn't work? Is it not FDA approved? Um, and I'm like, it is approved. Um, and these are the, 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 here's the information. A lot of those sources that they're getting a lot of times is just from, you know, someone who doesn't really have enough information. So I want to make sure that I read everything that's available. Oh, that, that, that's, I mean, man after my own heart. And, and I think it's, it's really important to, um, to make sure that what we're doing has that evidence base. And what's great about shockwave therapy in a way is the fact that it's being forced to prove itself time and time again because there are still people that say it doesn't work, we shouldn't be using it. So what you end up with is more studies about shockwave therapy than most other things that you can reasonably find. I think that um, you know things like injection therapy and, and acupuncture have, have had to go through these, these hoops and not always as successfully as shockwave has. There are many, many surgeries that have little or no positive research outcomes but because of dogma people are using them there are lots of treatment practices which have little or no positive research and they're being used due to dogma it's almost like when shockwave came along they closed the dogma account and said you're not allowed to do, you're not allowed to buy into that we've got that taken up with things like injection therapy and surgery you've got to prove beyond reasonable doubt that this works, otherwise we're not gonna have anything to do with it. And time and time again, Shockwave is doing that. And still, it's like pushing sand uphill for some people. I actually, I asked um, some of my, my colleagues from around the world, because uh, particularly I, I had somebody, uh, you know, that I, I knew very well, who was just completely against Shockwave, could find studies that said that it didn't work, and I'm showing studies that said that it did. And, uh, and you get this thing called confirmation bias. I'm enjoying the stuff that tells me it works. They're enjoying the stuff that says that it doesn't work. And of course, that's what a balanced opinion is all about. Nothing has a 100% success rate. And I said, what should I do with this person? And they said, just leave them be. Just leave them where they are. You crack on doing what you're doing. And, and I felt... <laughs> You know, it's a bit of a failure to leave someone behind, but in the end, I, I gave it my best shot and, and, and it didn't work. So there are always going to be people that, that, that don't buy into it. Um, so for those people... Well, that funny you should bring that up because... Go on. Well, sorry. Yeah. yeah you bring, I was actually asked a couple of years back to give a lecture at the American Pediatric Medical Association's national meeting. And I was giving it to a few hundred people, and my topic was on misconceptions and the myths that are available uh, through medicine and sports medicine. And, you know, cer certain things I was talking about is like, ice, does it really work? And, and cortisone injections, does it really work? And, and I would bring up shockwave and all. And at the end, there was a few minutes set aside for individuals to come up and give a little, uh, ask a question. And then a gentleman came up and a little bit gray hair like me. 
And uh, he said, hey, you know, I've been in practice for close to 40 years, and I think that everything you're saying is wrong because it wor- what I've been doing works for me. And it always works. And I'm like, well, that's very good. And he goes, no, so you're wrong. And I'm like, well, I, I, I beg to differ, and there is evidence. And he goes, no, I think you're, what you're, you're, this whole lecture is wrong. And I said, sir, you know, in my opinion, I was getting a little frustrated at this point in time, I'm being heckled. I said, um, you know how science and medicine evolves? I said, when the old scientists and doctors die, and um, I, I just dropped the mic there, and uh, I don't think I'm going to be getting Christmas cards from him, to be quite honest, but you know, that's the reality. We have to constantly question what we do. Um, and even this, you know, the reason why I think I'm a good person to come to for this is because I made mistakes. You know, I've learned it. I've, I've had, a, a, had in my hands quite a bit, and I've learned certain times where we failed because we weren't doing it the right way. And luckily, I've been able to communicate with people like yourself who have a large volume of experience utilizing it and other people in our, in our niche community. And we share best practices and we learn how to do things better. And one of the things that I'm learning that, you know, even up into this date that I could be better at is I need more time. So, you know, when patients come to me, I can't, they can't be a 10, 15 minute patient. They have to be a patient that takes some time you listen to them, that you put them in different positions in order to give this therapy properly, that you utilize everything you have here um, to make it best suited for them. And, you know, sometimes it's not just treating the, the, the part that hurts, but treating proximally or distally to that area as well. Um, that's one thing I really learned from you, Paul, um, when you gave our hands on treatment. You know, if you're dealing with someone who has heel pain, you have to get up into that calf as well, maybe even higher in order to break up some of the adhesions and, and release some of the structures to those areas. So it's from learning from my mistakes, I think I've gotten better. It yeah, humbles, and, humbles I, you. Yeah, and I think there's a, a, a great point to that, which I use, which is when I first started out, you know, dealing with patients one-on-one as a qualified practitioner, I felt like I had to know it all. I felt like if they came in with a condition I'd never even heard of before, or, or, or they were saying something that was new to me, that I had to almost try and cover my tracks and make sure that, that they didn't think that I didn't know. And the longer I've been doing this, you know, the, the more time that, that I've studied and made mistakes and learned from them and developed as a clinician, it's, it's almost turned around to be a happy day when something comes in that's new that I've not heard of, and I'm really happy to go, I've never heard of this before. Um, this has never <laughs> crossed my path. Because in the bell curve of, of all the things that I've seen over all the years I've been doing it, pretty much I, I can expect everything that is normal to come through. So if something's an outlier, A, it's a, it's a school day for me, which I love. But also I'm much, much more able through, through confidence to understand that the more I know, the more I understand are the things that I don't know. Great. And that's okay. It's okay to be in, in your sphere of things that you do know. And, and I think it's a strong clinician that can reflect and say, I'm not the best person to treat you, but actually I know someone who, who can. Um, and, and I think that's how we, we've all evolved. And what's great is there'll be people watching this that are nodding. Yeah, that was me. And there might be people right at the start of their career thinking, I don't want to make those mistakes but i would say to them that that i think you've got to make those mistakes um uh, initially in order to learn would you agree i totally agree you know um it's it's a it's a practice the perfect because we have to practice we have to get better and if you stay stagnant you're never going to be better Um, So it's constantly learning and gaining new information and reading the books and reading the articles and talking at those little side talks while you're having a beer. Those are the best ways to learn and and saying, hey, I never tried it for that. Can you tell me your protocol? Um, At that meeting, you know, I think we learned a lot. I mean, one of the things that I do a little bit more now is um, one of my close friends is Dr. Michael Chin from Chicago. And um, he utilizes things like amniotic injections in, as well as using this together. And for my patients where sometimes, and, and to be quite honest, this is not 
you know, um, is it a very high percentage of helping patients? Yes, but sometimes you need a little bit more of a boost. So um, I use some of his protocol for those patients that have not gotten better. And yet, guess what? We get full re fully recovered. Um, so sometimes you just got to figure out the other little missing piece that um, is appropriate for that individual. And the other thing you also learn too is um, the most important thing about doing shockwave is making the proper diagnosis. You know, don't be, don't think that, hey, you know, I know all the answers and you have this tendon issue or you have, you know, heel spur syndrome and maybe you don't. So what are the 10 other things that it could possibly be? And make sure it's not those first before you just start hitting them with this um, because you have this really cool tool or toy, I should say, in, in, your, in your practice. Yeah. Do we have a delay? Oh, I think I lost you. I see a smiling Paul, but I don't hear him. Uh oh. Paul, Paul, Paul. Where are you? <laughs> oh no. What if I move closer? Paul. I'm going to come as close to my internet source as possible. Paul? Nothing, huh? Ah. ah, you're back. Ah, we're back. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I, mean, I was walking around my office to see if maybe it's my internet connection. <laughs> no, it's, uh, you just froze there. You just froze. Um, yeah, same. So we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just tie this back in. Um, uh, 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 okay, so take, take someone who's coming to shockwave right now so they're they're in they're in business they're practicing but they don't have a machine what what advice would you give them for someone starting out how would you consider they even go about this they've got to they've got to find the funds for the machine in in the states they've got um a whole package of different people to talk to to get the relevant codes and then you've got the patient coming in how do you decide who has it who doesn't has have it um what what would the advice be from an American perspective on how you would get this started if you didn't have shockwave already? So my favorite part of the Olympics is when uh, all of the uh, different athletes are walking through at the very beginning of the Olympics. And you realize when you look at every one of those athletes that every one of those athletes also has what? A coach. So everyone needs a coach to get to where they need to be. They need a mentor. So find that mentor, you know, maybe it's Rob Cannonello, or maybe it's Paul or, or whoever it is, Dr. Chin, um, go to them and say, hey, I want to learn more about this. And I find out that the people who have the most amount of information are the most willing to teach. Um, they're excited to teach. The people who are maybe a little nervous about things will, won't let you in, but find and ask the people who have the most amount of information uh, questions. And, you know, to me, it's, it's exciting to teach and have other people learn. I don't care if the guy next door gets this because I want him to be able to help his patients and I know I'll help my patients. Um, I would love, and I do have this where I have uh, my residents or some newer doctors, they come to my office and um, they'll spend a day. They'll spend a day learning how we treat our patients and they can see, and I, I think that it's really important for them to have interaction with the patient and as far as communication and say, hey, what was your journey? What was your story? How did it start? When did you start to feel better? Um, what were the high points and low points of this journey as well? I think what, once you start getting that information, um, it's easy to sell the treatment. It's easy to sell it to the patient because they understand it. And they say, oh, you know, I've seen this before. Uh, I had a patient just like you who had sesamoid injury, and I saw them get better. Um, I heard from their own mouth. Um, what I do in my practice, patients sometimes are like, thank you so much. Is there anything I could do to help you? I'm like, yeah, if you don't mind, can you leave your story? You know, can you leave a review um, and tell your story? Because that's, that's strong. You know, if you get a, a story from someone who's been from this point to this point and they made a, you know, a great progress, that's really strong. So I think for a clinician, a new clinician, that's really important to feel comfortable um, in what they're going to embark on to next if they're going to make this this investment. Um, and also look into the, you know, there's obviously different companies and there's um, different types of devices out there. Um, 
but know who the players are and know what their strengths and weaknesses are when it comes to dealing with patients and what's most important for your practice. Um, in my practice, I felt that the best thing was partnering with care medics um, because their staff is full of information. They're, they're, they have tons of resources. They have the most variety of type of uh, machinery that I can utilize, and they're always there to support me. So that was really important for me is to utilize a company like Hermetic. Um, not that the other companies aren't good, but this one works best for me. So I think it's important to you know reach out and find the, the one that works best for you. Uh, I I agree, and um, you're you're presumably your you search for places to keep up your CPD. We say C, can, is it the same in the States, continued professional uh, we development. CME, continuing medical education. Right, okay, so yeah, same thing. Um, and, and is there a, a wealth of stuff, like where, where, do you, where do you go to find that stuff in the States? Obviously, Cura Medics invites people like myself and Carson to come out and teach you, but that can't just be it. There, there must be other things, the so videos online and do you do any stuff like that? So it's funny you should say that. Uh, we will be doing that at, uh, in a couple of hours with a few other docs from across the country. We're going to have a, a video call since we do have more time nowadays with our um, shelter at home situation. Um, so we will be doing that. But, you know, we also have meetings through the American Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine. We have an annual meeting uh, where we have hands-on ability to utilize uh, machinery like this and equipment. Um, but there, you know, we also have many other different um, uh, seminars that you can get to across the country locally. Uh, and I, I try my best to get it out there, you know. So this is one thing I've learned through this whole COVID-19 is that, you know, what a great resource we have to utilize things like these Zoom meetings um, to, to share best practices and, and also just to educate. Um, you know, I'm going to be doing many more videos uh, on Shockwave in general to just to educate not just my patients, but my peers to, to see, hey, this is what we're doing. Um, so it's not so foreign. Sometimes I find that even doctors, clinicians, uh, therapists, they're a little bit negative about uh, shockwave because they don't know enough about it. Um, and so they easy, easy for them to say, no, nah, just do this. this that's not going to work. But if they could see it, if, they could, if I could also bring, I'm going to do some of these meetings just like this with some of my really successful patients. Um, one of the ones I, I just contacted is a great story. If you have a moment, I'll tell you. He um, yeah. is an individual who lives four and a half hours from my practice, but he actually was in contact with another doctor um, who was actually in Florida, uh, Dr. Brian Fulham, who said, hey, you know, um, Dr. Rob Caninello is in New York area. Um, maybe you should go see him. And he would drive down here for four hours. And I said, what's your goal? And he is a, a very avid runner, and he's in his 50s. And he goes, I want to run rim to rim the Grand Canyon, and I, I plan on doing it this summer. And I'm like, okay. He goes, but my feet are killing me, and uh, I just can't I'll run two miles at this point in time. So we made it. That was his goal. We said, let's stick that goal up there on your refrigerator, and that's going to we're going to shoot for. So he came down um, six weeks back and forth, four hours, four hours back. He would stop and grab something at a local New Jersey diner, and then go back. And, uh, and, and he did it and he reached his goal and um, he ran rim to rim pain free. Um, he is still in contact with me all the time. And he says he's consistently pain free, not only from this, but also because of the lessons that we taught over those six weeks of things you need to continue to do. So that, that's, that, that's powerful. Those are the powerful things. I think those kind of stories need to get out there. Um, you know, and, and then we also have, you know, more simple stories, you know, like the, the older individual who, you know, hey, I want to mall walk. I just want to go to my local park and just do a lap, but my feet hurt me so much. So we, we, we offer them the, the, the treatment. We also teach them, hey, these are the shoes that maybe you should be wearing and you're not currently wearing, or hey, maybe you need to change your diet a little bit and stay away from certain things in order to get that BMI down. And, you know, those are tough conversations sometimes, but they're important. And I think um, that's what makes us uh, better clinicians because we're willing to have communication and develop trust. Trust is really important, right? If you don't have trust, nothing's gonna be gotten through to the individual. So um, I think in those times, we give patients time to hear what you have to tell them, um, you develop those, those, uh, those relationships. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And it reminds me, um, 
I went to a, a shockwave conference in the UK. It was at the Royal College of Surgeons. Beautiful oak lined room and they had all the great and the good from shockwave uh, from Europe there. And it, you may well have heard of Professor Rompe. He's done a lot of the tendinopathy oh, yeah, sure. research. And, um, and I didn't know him at the time. He was sat next to me. You know, the big round table sat next to me. And I you know, introduced myself at networking um, and, uh, and then saw his name tag. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is, you know, this is the guy. Anyway, he stood up. And, uh, and everyone was silent, waiting. You know, we were desperate to hear him speak. And he said, I'm going to start with this. He said, be the first person that your patient sees where you tell them the truth. And it, was, mm, it like stuck that. with me ever since. He said, too many people want to make everything look like Disneyland. Yeah, we're going to get this and you're going to be able to do that and it's going to be great. He said, be the first person to tell them the truth. They might not like it, but they will respect you. And in the end, when you get to the, the agreed goal that you've agreed between yourself, they're going to understand you. They're going to refer more people to you. And ultimately, that's got to be an evidence-based judgment. And it really stuck with me, not because I was lying to patients before that, but I'm naturally a glass half full person. And when the person sat there going, I, I've got to do this and I've got to achieve that, the temptation is to go, right, well, well, let's get you there. And, and in most cases, we can. But, but where it's a long shot, I think it's important that we tell the person it's a long shot and where we think they're holding themselves back. But it gives you the opportunity to have, under the guise of that statement, the ability to say to somebody, if you don't get your BMI down, if you don't lose some weight, you make my job and your goal impossible. And, and so you can, you know, I always say to people, I've got, 30 minutes to 40 minutes in your company once a week, maybe you've got 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, I'll put some skin in the game, but you've got to, you've got to do the hard yards, you know? Uh, and, and I think that once they understand that they can't yeah, just yeah. turn up for 30 minutes a week and you're just going to do everything like this magic machine or hands or whatever, then, then they really buy into it and you are much more likely to get, a decent end result. Uh, I think we're saying exactly the same thing, right? I agree. I mean, it's all about giving them a realistic expectation. Um, that's the key, you know, and, and to, you know, always focus on those goals. And, you know, I think one of the other reasons I sometimes clinicians fail and they might even fail with shockwave is they don't even get their individuals off the chair, off the table. Um, they're not just not seeing how these people are moving. They're not seeing where these people have asymmetries or, or um, you know, so many times I'll have a, an individual who's trained for a marathon because that's their goal. They really want to do it. And they're out there and they're putting in these hard miles, but they can't stand on one foot without losing their balance. I'm like, well, there's a problem there, right? And I don't care how good my machine is. It's not going to make a difference unless we can work on that as well. So, you know, those are things, you know, you need to start looking at the bigger picture of the of the patient or the athlete yeah I, I think you i think of it like a camera lens you you zoom out and you take a, a picture then you zoom in on 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 the area and you're constantly refocusing your attention depending upon what it is that you you feel the person needs um so that, that's really great rob I, I i always um ask the same two questions of people that i get involved with and this is because Exactly as I said out at the beginning, um, I want people to engage with us. I want to be at the uh, international conferences. I want people to come up and go, hey, you're, you're Rob. I saw your interview or you're Paul. I see you do these interviews. Uh, and so it's really interesting for people to understand a little bit around you. So it's not just shockwave. So what, what are your two part question? What are your key things you do outside of being a clinician and what is number one on your bucket list? Oh, that's really cool. Good question. Um, so I, I enjoy fitness. Um, uh, I'm currently uh, doing quite a bit of my, on my Peloton, uh, which I'm really enjoying. Um, it's, it's working, but I also meet with a group of guys three to four times a week, and we do uh, a core workout together at 6 a.m. before we start our day. And I really look forward to that because uh, – not only is it, is it a great opportunity to get strong, 55 years old now, um, 
I'm, I don't want to live in the, back in the you know, glory days. I want to continue. I want to be stronger and healthier when I'm 60 than when I was 50. Um, but it's also a great camaraderie. It's good fun and socialization. So I love that kind of stuff. I obviously um, uh, love my family, my wife and my three kids uh, keep me very occupied and busy. And I love seeing them grow and uh, reach their goals and successes um, as both uh, as individuals, as athletes, as academics. Um, so that's really, uh, a, a, that's my, my, my love and my passion is my family. Um, my bucket list. Hmm. So, you know, one of my biggest bucket list things I would love to do is something that you've already done, which is write some books. Um, oh. But I've never felt as though I, I was enough to do it. Um, my story, um, um, my story is kind of uh, evolves around the fact that uh, I'm a stage four throat cancer survivor, and um, it's it, it's kind of an interesting story. And for so many times, people say I need to get that story out there, and and, and maybe this time of uh, shelter at home and slowing things down, I might have the opportunity to to write that book um, and write that story um, because it's not just a story about a guy who has cancer, it's a story about others. It's a story about how others helped me, helped me continue to where I am, continue to keep, stay healthy, um, realize the goodness in people. Um, when I was out, people took it upon themselves, my competitors, to unbeknownst to me, keep my practice going. And they would come in here and see my patients without me knowing that at all. And uh, just because they're, they're good, there's a lot of goodness out there as well. Um, so it's a, it, I want it to be more of a story of hope, you know, hold on, possibilities exist is what hope stands for, or hearing other people's experiences is what hope stands for. So I would love to write that book. And I think at this time of uh, uncertainty with, you know, our coronavirus right now, the story of hope is really important for all of us. So that's really my book list is to maybe write that story down, write a book, um, be more like Paul and, and get, get it down in, in written words. I, I, I'll tell you something that um, that would be a very cathartic thing to write about. And it would, uh, it'd be far better than, uh, than anything I'd written because, you know, <laughs> the, 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 when I was writing my first book, Running Free of Injuries, it was all about me just putting into the keyboard what I would do on a day to day basis. What, what yours would be about is this incredible, journey personal you know psychological physical um the the whole thing and it would be it would be incredible if you could interweave that within um within the the knowledge around your practice and, and, and what you do for a living and, and stuff so that that just came out of nowhere did it throat cancer it's like you weren't a chain smoker in a former life or no never have always been athletic um you know it's a little frustrating that came out of nowhere um and, uh, it, you know, it started off, believe it or not, a few, a year beforehand with incredible pain in my head and in my ear. And um, I had brain surgery because they said I had what's called glossopharyngeal neuralgia, an entrapment of my ninth cranial nerve. So they first did brain surgery, which was a large thing to, to come off over. Um, and it took some time. Um, and being a solo practitioner was really difficult for my practice economically, as you can imagine. Um, but a year later, I started saying, gosh, these pains are still there, and it's, it's unbelievable. And I went to a couple different docs, and you know, including a brain surgeon, and they're like, oh, we don't think there's anything wrong here. So, you know, it, it, I, I said, there's got to be something wrong, and we kept trying to figure it out. And at a point in time, they started saying to me, hey, you know what, maybe you're just a little anxious, you're a little stressful, and maybe you need to take some medications to kind of calm you down. I'm like, no. I'm not going to do that. So I had to continue to advocate for myself, which is what I think this journey really was about. And this is how it kind of relates to my patients is that I said, no, I'm not stressful. I'm actually a knucklehead. You know, I'm someone who kind of takes things easy and, and enjoys a good laugh. And, 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 and I'm not stressed at all about this. I'm really having pain. So they kept looking further and further. And then finally they said, oh, and they called me up and they said, you never had glossopharyngeal neuralgia. You didn't need the brain surgery. You have a huge tumor in your throat. Um, the surgeon actually said to me afterwards, he said, hey, 
the procedure that I did really wasn't needed. Um, and I missed your diagnosis and I prolonged your cancer and I made it spread to become stage four and to be getting it sooner. And uh, he actually said this to me over, he invited me to dinner and he, he said to me, uh, I want to ask you, he was writing a book at the time. And, and I, I never went to dinner on a brain surgeon, my brain surgeon before, but it was kind of, he wanted to come out with me. And he said, you know, I, I want you to be in my book. I think your story is really important. And uh, I'm like, sure, whatever. And then he said, and by the way, I, I'm going to beg for your forgiveness because I did not need a brain surgery on you. And I was like, well, that's a little heavy over appetizers, but yeah. um, okay. So, you know, I said, well, what did you learn? I don't know where, where I got the grace to say this as we were, he was telling me this. I said, well, what did you learn from him? And he said, I learned that every time someone presents to me with your situation, I got to think of the 10 other things, the zebras that it could also have been. And that's what I've learned from it. Um, so I said, yeah, I said, you could do a lot more good things. Uh, so yeah, you have my forgiveness and uh, go do some great things. Um, that's my, my, my word. Also. I always say do great things. That's uh, kind of, I have shirts that say that, tell my kids that do great things. So I said, go do great things. So the long and the short of it was a month later, he, I was in my office taking care of a patient and I got a knock on the door and it was my, my nurse. And she said, Hey, doc is on the phone. He wants to talk to you about something very important. If you could get to it, I'm like, yeah, sure. And sure enough, he said, I just had a patient exactly your situation. Um, and we did some further tests and he has stage one throat cancer. And we're going to be able to keep him from having a lot of suffering. And, you know, for me, it was a 20% survival rate. And um, for some reason, I'm sticking around to bug my wife a little bit longer. But, um, you know, for this individual, I said, hey, you know what, you just, you just make, save this person's life. So that's what we learn from each other. We have to learn to advocate for ourselves. We have to learn to be vigilant in everything that we do. We have to look for the zebras and not just always assume everything is what we think it is as clinicians. Um, and we have to believe and listen to our patients. You know, if our patients are saying that this thing really bothers me, it bothers them, okay? And we have to figure out why, because maybe there's something that we're missing. Don't just look at the what, look at the why, and understand why things are going on. So that was that's uh, think, a really long answer to what I would like to do have my bucket list is that's what it would be. Well, uh, yeah, I would I would definitely buy that book because I could have <laughs> sat and listened to that. Uh, and and first of all, congratulations for a getting through that, and b having the grace to forgive that guy, and c giving him the confidence to go ahead and save other people's lives. Where uh, perhaps if um, if you'd said no, I'm going to sue the ass off you and, and all this sort of right. stuff he, he might turn into a different character so i i think it's a, a, a excellent story an excellent way for us to finish our chat so i it, it's been so enjoyable uh, i will watch this over and over myself again um i want to thank you so much rob cananello from new york um, new york and yeah. uh, New York, um, uh, and, and just thank you so much for taking the time out of, out of your day to come and join me. It's been a pleasure. It's a lot of fun. Um, I love you as a, as a clinician, as a friend, and as a personality. Um, you offer so much.